you go. Uh, good afternoon. Um, is anyone else hangover, hangover today? And do we have any keynote experts in the house? Um, so uh, my name is Paul Reeves. Um, I'm the senior developer for uh, what used to be known as MTV UK, um, but we are now uh, Viacom International Media Networks, Media Technology Services, Digital Media and Innovation Lab. Um, <laughs> I've got really long business cards. Um, We've been using Drupal for a while, really. Uh, sorry, all my notes on my phone is quite annoying. Um, so we started using Drupal in 2006, um, and this was built for us by Lullabot on um, Drupal 4.7. Uh, it was primarily really to support the broadcast channel, um, but we also had uh, an interactive channel uh, called MTV Flux. Um, and so Drupal was the, uh, the gateway to this, really, with um, the sort of user-generating content and stuff, and people were able to uh, upload content and it gets aired on the channel uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, so by the end of 2007, uh, I got this stat from The Guardian, so I'm not going to get in trouble for giving out figures this time. Um, we saw we'd seen a 771% year-on-year increase uh, in the number of video clips viewed online. So when we launched in 2009, um, our content strategy had really changed a fair bit from when we launched in 2006. Uh, the MTV Flux interactive uh, channel had been killed off, uh, which I guess is because it was surely ahead of its time rather than the fact that it just didn't work. And uh, I'm saying so many bad things, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> and uh, when we migrated over, um, we, so we went over with five years of content I think that we migrated across uh, into Drupal 5. Um, this is, you know, some of it had originated uh, in Drupal and other bits had come across from pre-Drupal systems that were put in Java and various other things. Um, so it was a mess, frankly, and we had to clean up a lot of this stuff. Um, but it was then that we really started uh, realizing, well, I don't know why we didn't realize sooner, um, that we needed well-structured content, uh, you know, um, we needed to future-proof all our content, really. So at that point is when we started, you know, sort of storing high-res images for everything rather than uh, just the version that we needed at that particular point in time. Um, over the next few years, uh, our responsibilities expanded somewhat. Um, we took on a few other brands with Comedy Central and Nickelodeon. Uh, multiple regions as well, and I can't remember what the flags are, are but there's definitely Israel in there, Australia, um, Hungary, I think is one of those. <laughs> and, uh, um, but we also look after, you know, the ex-emerging markets, so, uh, this, yeah, the stuff that has now emerged, basically. Um, we inherited also a lot of uh, legacy platforms, uh, Microsoft.net, Java, Zen Framework, um, so in addition to supporting uh, all of this new legacy stuff, we started creating our own legacy stuff. Uh, MTVOD uh, was uh, our video on demand platform uh, that was um, built on Drupal 6, and this is subscription-based. Um, we take payments via SMS, PayPal, uh, and now iTunes. We also launched um, the website for a new TV channel on Freeview, which is Viva. Um, and this is also running Drupal 6 and uh, MTV Style, which is a style blog running on Drupal 7. That was our kind of first responsive site that we'd done. Um, and we're also doing a lot of broadcast integration at that point as well. So we're using web services on Drupal 6 to uh, dynamically generate content for, I think it's now 10 of our music channels in the UK. Um, and it's for various you know, programming blocks. We also have social media feeds that are incoming and generating on-screen graphics and, and things like that. Um, plus, we're using Drupal 7 services to um, manage our digital file asset delivery to um, external or third-party uh, video on-demand services, so SkyGo, uh, Virgin Media, and there's probably 20 or 30 more that are integrating with um, Final Cut Server to manage uh, delivery of video assets. <coughs> So for a team of two to three developers, um, this was, uh, I say two to three because one of them is a bit insane. Why am I saying this shit? Um, <laughs> he's left, it's fine. He won't be watching. 
Um, yeah, we, we were massively overstretching ourselves. Um, and the, the, the support for all the legacy platforms meant that um, every time we came to do a new Drupal build, uh, that became legacy the moment we launched it. You know, um, we were supporting across Drupal 5, Drupal 6, Drupal 7. I think we even had a 4.7 site, uh, 4 site that was still lurking around in the background. Um, yeah, not good. Things needed to change. So in 2012, when we kicked off um, the MTV UK rebuild, uh, we were given these business priorities, uh, the priorities from the business. Um, <coughs> It needed to be multi-platform, mobile-first design. Uh, the content needed to be platform and device agnostic. So at that point, you know, it, uh, we're feeding stuff out to various, um, you know, mobile apps, um, digital TV services, uh, broadcast, you know, linear TV stuff. Um, our content is kind of going everywhere now. Um, and this is where the, you know, the future-proofing stuff that we did back in 2008 really started to. Uh, started to pay off, you know. Um, instead of just saying, "Okay, well, we've got an image that's 300 by 225 pixels on the on the site," that's the version we'll store. You know, we'll store the enormous version that's, you know, 3,000 by whatever uh, the ratio is for 4.3. Um, and so we're storing high res images everywhere. Um, so that really paid off for us. Um, we needed greater flexibility to support marketing and commercial activities. Um, the old site was, you know. Uh, it had a certain amount of flexibility, um, but we were using like panels two, beta three, or something, and uh, things have moved on quite a lot since then. Um, and we also needed a staging environment for our editorial production teams um, because, you know, for like five years or something, they'd just been working directly on live. Uh, any mistakes they made would get cached on Akamai for days <laughs> sometimes, you know, and so they, they needed a sort of a, 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 sort of a solid staging environment. Uh, internally as well, our dev team, um, banging the microphone, um, <coughs> yeah, internally our, de uh, our dev team, we really had our own priorities uh, as well, you know, we needed to standardize our development workflows, um, which we didn't really have any development workflows before that, you know, people were uh, occasionally editing code live on the server, there was no release procedures or anything, so uh, I think we'd been, you know, we had been at least doing version control with SVN um, when it wasn't an emergency, <laughs> you know. Um, but so we, we standardized using um, the branch per feature uh, workflow, which is um, kind of like Git flow, but slightly different. Um, and uh, got some proper release management stuff in place. We're also using Vagrant uh, for our dev environment. Um, and, you know, these kind of things were, were we got help with this. Um, I think we, at this point we were really learning how to be a proper software development team rather than just the guys who build websites. Um, so we had a lot of external help from, you know, the likes of Bright Lemon, Agile Collective, Mr. Mothersill over there who, who really sort of helped us um, um, drag us into <laughs> the 2010s. Um, we needed to stop building silos and start building usable components. Um, this, I mean, it, it was just essential, you know. Um, we, we couldn't afford to, to have completely disparate sites that had no reusable code, no reusable anything, you know. Um, so, and be kind to our future selves. I mean, that's everything really, you know. Um, when you talk about making your code or making your build friendly for other developers, um, another developer is you in six months' time when you're coming back to your own code. So we really... Um, needed to stop creating unnecessary work for ourselves. So, <coughs> we chose to um, build the new platform on a hub-spoke model, and I will refer back to my notes on this. So, content gets created at the hub, the one in the middle, um, and then deployed to front-end sites using, using services. Um, we never have any editors log into our front-end site ever. Uh, even site builders don't log into the front-end site. Everything, um, my notes here say, uh, everything they need to update on a daily basis should be managed and deployable from the hub. So this does have many benefits, uh, not least 
editors have the same tools and workflow regardless of which site they're working on. Um, so when we, when we uh, did the 2008 Drupal 5 build for MTV, probably about 50% of that build was um, spent working on editorial tools. Um, and we needed to make it really as easy as possible for editors to create structured content and uh, not be lazy, not skip fields, all of that kind of thing. You know? So not overloading them with unnecessary stuff, getting exactly what we want from the editors. Um, and the neutral environment really promotes focus on content instead of presentation. Um, they're focusing really on what the content is rather than what they're doing with it. Because what they do with it, you know, might be five different things today, and it might be another five different things next week, next year, whatever. We never, kn we never know really what we'll be doing with our content in the future. <coughs> and baking deployment of services into core, into the core platform, means that content is portable from the outset. So. Um, much like you know, Drupal 8 services and stuff is, is baked into the core, really. Uh, it just makes it that much easier. We haven't got to then go, okay, well, how are we going to get our content out to deploy elsewhere to push it into whatever um, you know, third-party system? Um, because that's the way we do it anyway for all of our stuff. So everything gets pushed around. Staging and development front-end sites can be quickly spin up using an install profile. So all of our front-end sites are built with... Uh, a standard base install profile. We have an MTV install profile. Um, any updates that need to be done to that on live, if it's structural things, it has to go in the install profile. We run update hooks. Nobody should ever, even site builders never front log in to the production site to change settings on live. This always gets done in code. So doing this means that you, when you're working in your dev sandbox, you run the install profile, you're going to get exactly what is on live, minus the content. And this means for staging as well. Our staging site is an exact replica of what it is on production, because we used exactly the same install profile. Um, the update hooks get run on both and all of that kind of stuff. Front end projects can focus purely on the front end. As I said before, the 50% uh, of the time that we spent working on editorial tools doesn't need to be done now for every new site that we build because we have those standard editorial tools that are in place. And we only need to main, maintain one editorial platform. So when we found, you know, we had MTV UK running Drupal 5, um, Viva running on Drupal 6, you know, uh, MTV Star running on Drupal 7, um, we, we couldn't really afford to to rebuild all of those editorial tools every single time. So you get completely different tools across all of our platforms. Um, you'd also find that newer versions obviously had, even though they didn't have the same tools, they might have some better tools than the older versions did. And we, we couldn't really, we didn't have the resources to backport all of that stuff. So maintaining only one editorial platform means that any new builds, we just focus on front end, dramatically reduces time to life for projects. It does have some challenges. Not everything is deployable. Menus aren't deployable. Panel pages aren't deployable. Node queues aren't deployable. Um, there's probably quite a few other things. <laughs> but those are the main ones. Rigid access, access controls are required to ensure content from one site doesn't or cannot leak onto another. Um, so it, it, in our hub, we have um, what we call namespaces for content. And I guess it's, it works in a very similar way to organic groups. Um, if you're a member of MTV UK, you can create content in MTV UK. If you're a member of MTV UK and MTV Russia, you can create content in both. But when you switch between those namespaces, we can't have stuff leaking from one to another. When you do an entity reference, uh, you want to make sure that the, re the entities you're referencing are only in that current namespace. You don't want to be able to deploy a Russian entity over to MTV UK. Entity dependency management is really tricky. Um, what do we do if we're trying to deploy a piece of content and one of the dependent entities, something that's been referenced, uh, is unpublished? How do we deal with that? How do we stop dependent entities from being deleted? How do we stop any entities from being deleted? Because we can't delete them from the hub because that means we've lost control of them. They're not there on the front end site anymore, and nobody ever logs into the front end site. We can do, 
but you know that breaks the principle. So some of the ways we solve this. <coughs> Using panels for us was essential for our production team to, to be able to quickly uh, update and create new landing pages across the site. They need to update the home page, uh, the news page, a show page, or whatever. Um, they need to be able to do that very quickly without asking the developer to deploy code for them. Uh, this is day-to-day -day production stuff that the dev team should not be involved in. We could have just exported them to code. But the immediate problem we found is that um, there's very often there's uh, dependent entities uh, within those panel layouts that are unique to that front end site. So we can't have something that's baked into code that relies on an entity that doesn't exist in Russia but does exist in UK. And when you spin up you know, a dev site, you're not going to have any content in there. So those dependent entities aren't going to be coming around. So we solved this uh, by creating a custom entity to wrap around the C tools export code. And it sounds really dirty, and it kind of is, but it works really nicely. Um, what you see here is a list of our uh, exportable entities. So essentially, we, we hook in uh, to, the, to panels. We have an extra handler on panels that runs through the normal export process that you do when you export a page or export a variant. Um, it runs through this, converts all of the local IDs to UUIDs, wraps that in an entity, uses deploy to send that back to the hub. So page manager, pages, landing pages, all of that kind of stuff, we're now able to deploy that. We can move it from a sandbox or from a staging area, push that back to the hub, and then that can be deployed to live using services, the normal workflows. Uh, we kind of ruled out no queue pretty much straight away because we had some uh, some requirements that went beyond what no queue no queue could do. Uh, sometimes we need to promote content using a different image or copy to that which is set in the node. So if we've got you know a new episode one series three of Pimp My Ride uh, online on the home page, we might want to say watch this now. We don't want to change the title of the node to be able to do that. We also need to promote entities which aren't nodes. Um, so we, uh, with our content model, we have a custom entity called a subject entity. Uh, we don't use taxonomy that much, really. We have a subject entity, and, and um, this uses uh, schema.org definitions to define things that you're creating content about. So a content type is a news story. This is about Britney Spears. Britney Spears is a subject. So we have this whole list of subjects. Um, so sometimes we need to promote those. You know, <coughs> Pimp My Ride is a show, less a subject. It's not a node. We need to be able to promote that. Uh, and other times we need to promote external content. We're running you know, a campaign with, uh, with the government at the moment called Call It Out. It's an anti-abuse campaign. We need to be able to link to that external site. This isn't a node. We don't want to have to create a node to be able to do that. So the key to this really was a standardized content model without using features. Um, we have an aversion to features. We just don't like it. Sorry, Neil. We just don't. We, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that there. Um, it is possible. You don't have to use features to export your uh, content types to code. Um, we have uh, a global install, which creates global fields for us, standard fields that every content type has to have has a summary field, has an image, a promo image. Obviously, everything has a title. So on install, this goes through. We have the field definitions. It creates the fields for us. We then have our content type install files, one for each content type. Here's a gallery. Uh, we define the, the node type at the top and uh, the field instances. So we add in those standard fields plus anything that's required for the content type. Um, this stuff, the export code, I think you can use this module called Field, it's field ex, uh, Inspector or Field Explorer, one of the two, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but you can use that to get that export code, paste it into your install file. 
You don't need features to do this. So we have a promo box content type, which uh, replaces node queue. It has, um, you can see the fields on there. So the content field is an entity reference field. So if we want to reference a piece of content, we just enter, uh, entity reference it. It uses the standard fields. And these, these fields you know, get used everywhere, all of our promo listings. Uh, it also goes into our meta tags, open graph tags for Facebook, Twitter, all of that kind of stuff. So you can leave all of those fields empty and it will inherit those standard fields from the reference content. Or you can override it. So if there's anything, if you want to say change the title to watch Julie Shaw episode one now, and you just override that title and it will replace the one from the reference entity. You can use this also to uh, link to external content just by not referencing anything and fill in all of your fields. So this gives us a great deal of flexibility. Um, this is actually, a f we use a fieldable panels pane for this. Uh, it's a custom bundle of fieldable panels pane. So these promo boxes, uh, they can be dropped straight into your panel layouts. Menus, we've sold in pretty much the same way. We don't use the menu system at all. We don't use core menus. Um, we have a custom entity with a bunch of fields. I mean, the menu is just a list of links. You know, um, we can put in a link type, or we can reference uh, a node or a subject entity. Put in the attributes, override the <coughs> URL, whatever we need to. Editor web workflow. Um, this is really key to be able to. <clears throat> being able to get content staging working. Um, we looked at Workbench Moderate, which is, this is a screen grab from Workbench Moderate, um, and it did pretty much everything that we need to do apart from the fact that it only did nodes. We had custom entities everywhere. Um, so uh, I can't remember why we chose to just rebuild our own one rather than <laughs> refactor Workbench um, but I, I suspect it was probably down to a lack of time. We just didn't have time to, you know, to go through that. But hopefully we'll contribute all of our stuff back. Um, so workflow states are used to trigger deployment. Uh, if you set a workflow state to staging, it will trigger that entity to staging, to the staging instance. If you, trigger it, if you set it to published, this will then deploy the content to our production site and the staging site, so that staging is always up to date. And we can also schedule workflow state changes as well. So we can set something to change to published at midnight, which will trigger deployment. So Workbench Moderate uh, requires revisions, so all of our entities had to be revisions too, uh, revisionable too. And when we started doing this, then something wonderful happened. We were very happy. It was completely by surprise, really. It meant that menus, promo boxes, and panel pages have revisions. So all of our landing pages are now revisionable. We have a complete history. Everything that was changed, we can roll back. We can schedule everything for deployment. So we can make a bunch of changes to the home page and say, I want this to go live at midnight. And our home page will update at midnight. Sweet. On to deployment. <coughs> We're using uh, the deploy module everywhere. <coughs> Thanks, Dick. <laughs> um, and uh, and everything gets received by services on the front end. Um, th this deployment gives you um, these processes, memory processor, where everything just gets done immediately. Batch API gets, you know, uses the batch API to. Pro process everything in the UI or Q API. Uh, and Q generally runs off of cron by default. Um, but we found using Q API with Beanstalk D and Supervisor D, um, we can have asynchronous deployments going on. So when someone changes something to publish, you know, some of our galleries might have 100 images in that. With all the referenced entities, we might have 300 entities or something that needs to be deployed um, for a piece of content. And it takes a long time. Uh, especially with high-res images. So moving it 
away from the user space, you know, not blocking the user from doing stuff while their content was being deployed was key for us really. So the, the deployment job gets pushed into the Beanstalk queue. Supervisor sits there watching the Beanstalk queue. As soon as it finds a job, it deploys it. The queue can get massive. We have one queue. At first we had one queue. Um, at the moment there's only one guy who's working on MCV Russia. We've got about 10 working on MCV UK. So the ball from MTV Russia often has to wait somewhere near the back of the queue while everything for MTV UK is being deployed. There's not much we can do about it, it just works through the queue. Sometimes there's an unexpected item in the bagging area. <laughs> the queue breaks for whatever reason. Something's just not deploying. Uh, it could be something to do with a broken reference entity that it's not published or something like that. Something will start failing and the whole queue gets blocked because someone has published a bad piece of content. Russia can now not publish anything because someone in UK has done something stupid, which they never do. So the steps we took to try to resolve this. Step one, do less work. Uh, make, make the deploy reduce the number of operations that we, that we needed to perform to actually get content deployed. So really, we, um, for this one, we found that because there's so many entity references everywhere, there's so many entity dependencies, the same entities will be deployed over and over and over and over again. So the first thing we did was um, look at the uh, it was one of the plugins, I can't remember which one it is. Long night. Um, uh, we looked at one of the plugins to um, start logging all of the entities that we were deploying and the revision that, of that entity that we deployed. So when it comes to deploying it again, if we've already deployed that revision, we don't need to make another HTTP request to get that deployed. So do less work. Step two, create more workers. Um, early experiments with this uh, were kind of successful. Um, Sufaz D does allow you to have multiple workers per queue, um, but we often run into uh, race conditions where new entities would get deployed as dependencies of multiple entities, which results in duplication of entities. We really don't want something like this to happen. So. The approach that we that we settled on was to have multiple queues. We've also got more efficient workers already. Multiple queues. Um, we have uh, the custom processor, which instead of having the normal deploy queue, which is the standard queue, um, we create a queue per endpoint. So we have a separate queue for NTV UK staging, a separate one for pr uh, production, a separate one for NTV Russia staging, production, etc., etc., etc. So because we can only have one worker per queue, we just increase the number of queues. Everyone's happy. I'm glossing over some of the details, sorry. Uh, so what next for us? Um, we're just about to start on uh, the Comedy Central build. Uh, it's going to be our next brand that's coming onto the Drupal platform and off of the Java one that they're on at the moment. So really our, our hub spoke at the moment is looking pretty much like this with MTV UK and MTV Russia. Uh, give it about four months, and we'll start looking like this. Probably this time next year, we'll be somewhere there, uh, rolling this out across our other regions and getting MTV Australia on board. And uh, Yeah, hopefully the whole of ICOM eventually will move off of Java. That'd be lovely. That's it. Questions? Anyone? <coughs> No, no, no. We, they're, they're completely separate Drupal installs. Yeah. Um, yeah, separate database, separate memcache. Um, could be in a completely different hosting environment if you want. Uh, we have our own corporate hosting environment, so everything's 
um, sat in our own VM, internal VM cloud. Um, but yeah, these are these are effectively separate Drupal sites. Do they share exactly the same There are shared there are shared elements of the code base. So we have we have multiple install profiles. Um, we have a base profile, and then uh, MCV Russia extends the base profile to add in translations and things like that. Um, uh, but yeah, we have it's a standard code base that you know all of the same modules get enabled pretty much, and we have a few custom ones, you know, on a per site basis if we need to. Um, for panel pages, we have um, uh, panels inheritance. So for con the content panel pages and system panel pages, obviously two different things. So we have a, a standard uh, panels module um, which provides the default layouts for all of our node types. Uh, and you know, it's got about 20 or 30 variants in there or something. Uh, but then each front end site can, uh, we, when we're including all of those as the default panel pages, we run an auto um, on that array. Uh, and then front end sites can then say, well, actually, for an artful type, I want to use my own node type, uh, my own node variant, sorry. So you can switch those out. But yeah, we try to have as much of that kind of inheritance as possible. And the standard, you know, with a standard install, you'll get everything. Uh, and then you can override bits, okay? Yeah. Uh, not using features sounds quite controversial. Hmm. What are the pros and cons of uh, going down the route? Um, which we found it a lot easier to, main, to, to keep control over everything, really. You know? um, we, we have a, a fairly rigid uh, naming structure for all of our fields, um, so it made sense to put these all in code. Um, you know, if, if a field is called Vim and something, we know that it's one of our own internal Viacom fields and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I guess we've been burned by it in the past where you have sort of features that are, I can't remember what it is, when features get overridden or something like that and you get all of those kind of errors and blah, 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 blah. And um, yeah, we, I think we're deeply mistrust and distrustful <laughs> of features. Um, and uh, you know, as I said, uh, there, there was very little that we actually needed it for, really. Um, you know, for the sake of, okay, you can export content type to a feature and then export that to code, or you can use Node Explore, Explorer to, uh, sorry, Field Explorer to, you know, get the field definition to code. It's pretty much the same workflow, but without having, you know, uh, a middleware module that's doing stuff that you don't quite know about, you know. Um, we don't use views as well, which is probably just as controversial, if not more so. <laughs> I'll just drop that one in. Uh, uh, we, we had a lot of trouble with, uh, with, um, translating views configuration across sites and it was much easier just to not use it. Um, uh, our site builders don't really need to use views because we have, we have standardized layouts and things so we have a, a couple of plugins that just run entity field queries with options um, for all of our content types that we know about because we create all of our content types in code so everything's known to us really you know um, and yeah sort of working around views uh, proved to be a much more of a headache than just writing a few queries. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, go on your first. Uh, yeah. Are there about translations and how are you translations in the... So at the Central Hub we don't use translations. If there's a Russian, if there's a Russian editor in the Russian namespace and he's putting Russian content in, that's it. Uh, there's, there's no real link between content at the hub so at the moment. Not, n not yet. Not yet. No. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something we'll look at. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 we haven't really had a need to tackle it yet. Um, so a lot of the content that does get shared across regions comes from um, our international content repository. Um, and they deal with translations there, and they have localization. So MTV Russia has a feed of all of it. If you say, you know, if you're hitting the MTV Russia feed on, on the international platform, you say, give me the hills, it'll give you the Russian version of the hills. So when we're importing stuff in, we don't need to know about all of the other versions. We just know about the one that we want, which is the Russian version of it. So, uh, and anything that gets created locally uh, tends not to be shared that much. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, 
it's difficult to justify sort of coming up with our own way of localising content when it's already been done by, the, by our international team in New York. It's got duplication of effort, really. Yeah. Not really. No, it's just a list of links. You know, you're rendering out a link and it knows. We had to do a bit of custom work about active trails uh, and, and the active trail stuff. But uh, you know, I mean, I've done that before and had a nightmare trying to work that stuff out anyway. You know, but we have our own uh, content structure, so you know, we'd have had to do a load of work to uh, work around the sort of active trail stuff in in core menu. To get it to work with our, with our, um, with our content structure, with our rules, um, yeah, we didn't really find it a problem. Surprisingly easy. So. No, we don't. None at all. All of our traffic's anonymous. Um, any, uh, I mean, we used to do a lot of social stuff back in the day, but um, uh, at some point, I can't remember exactly when, Viacom bought. Um, God, what was it called? There, was, there used to be a social network called Tag World, which is a Russian-based thing. Uh, Viacom acquired that, um, and they've built out a set of um, social widgets, the JavaScript widgets that we just drop into our site. So there's, there's, there's no need. We'll let someone else deal with it. Um, I'd, ra I'd rather not deal with authenticated users if I can help it. You know. Mm. It's not yet. Yeah. We'll try and. Uh, I mean, uh, I'd, there's a lot of our specific stuff that's in there, so. I definitely want to generate. We definitely want to release it, but yeah, it's, it's a case of, you know, um, we have quite an aggressive rollout plan over the next year or so for, for all of the other brands and regions, and, and at some point the dust will settle, and then hopefully we can start. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean. Uh, I, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at it. I mean, if you drop me an email to remind me or something, and yeah, I'll take a look at it. And I mean, if, if there's nothing that's um, that's that's too nasty, I'll probably, I might just be able to release it, but I'll, or at least put it up as a sandbox. Yeah. Hello. Um, <coughs> Um, yes. Ah. <laughs> um, testing um, is uh, something that we're rubbish at. <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest. Um, we do have a, a, a suite of B hat tests um, that, uh, that someone kindly made for us. <laughs> um, and uh, but yeah, I mean. You know, we launched to MTV UK like four weeks ago, and and you know it was a a long hard slog to get there. So at the moment we're we're kind of doing a, a small bit of regathering and you know uh, improving our workflows and testing is like there on the agenda, so high on the agenda at the moment. Um, but we you know um, our test coverage is pretty poor at the moment, like less than half a percent or something. Uh, and they mainly be hat tests. So I don't think we have any simple tests or PHP unit tests or whatever for for our custom code. Um, uh, at some point, we will say from now on, nothing will go in without a test. Um, but we haven't quite reached that point yet. And Drupal 8, um, uh, I wish we could have built this on Drupal 8, um, and especially our front end sites. But you know, I mean, I think using this kind of model does put us in a good place for Drupal 8. You know, because we could build a front-end site that's on Drupal 8. And as long as it's got the same concept model, we can deploy content to it. So there's nothing stopping us from doing that. Um, hopefully, you know, I mean, it obviously means we're then maintaining two versions of it. But we would hope to be able to start then porting everything across to 8. But yeah, I mean, there's, I, I see no reason why we couldn't have both, or even have 8 at the core in the hub, you know, because the, I think there's been quite a few improvements to you know editorial workflow stuff in eight, so we'd take a view on it. I'd really want, to, I'd love to be able to use Twig on the front end as well. So I just rebuild it all on eight. <laughs> no, uh, no, I mean you know we'll probably on, be on seven for a, for a few years yet.
Not, <clears throat> not really, no. I mean, because so much of the config is, is deployable, you know, I mean, say config, um, you know, things like panel pages and all that kind of stuff, because we can deploy all of that, we could schedule all of that to go live with content, you know. Um, we're using the hook entity dependency stuff with all of our deployable panel pages so that any dependent entities for that panel layout will get deployed with the panel page as well. So we could just schedule a new layout to go live and it will take all the content with it. Um, but as yet, we haven't found any need to do that. Um, so when we run the export, so from the, I guess I'll call it the sandbox, the bit that they've made the changes in, um, it runs, when it runs through the, um, the export handler to generate the export code, uh, we run, uh, we pass the export code to find any dependent entities from UUIDs and that kind of thing. We run hook entity dependency on that as well, so other things can come along with it. Um, and then all of those <coughs> get deployed first, the same way that, that, that deploy does. So they all get deployed ahead of the, uh, the, the, the export or wrapper entity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fieldable panels pane um, is is a a shareable entity, you know. So even though you can drop it in directly in the in the panels UI, you can say make this shareable. Um, the way that we use those promo boxes as well is that um, that kind of gets used for everything, for all listings, you know, all all sort of curated lists of of content. So our carousels run off of a promo box. It's just a different view mode, um, and all of our listings lists just all you know. We kind of try to use that same. Uh, component wherever possible, um, but yeah, that's that's an entity that can just be dropped in. Um, anyone? Oh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> oh, we're hiring. We're hiring. We're looking for some uh, a few good core developers uh, for our core platform, not Drupal core, our core. Um, and uh, we're also looking for a theme as well. So, yes. Cheers. <laughs>